Ken? Now we're live. We're late. <laughs> so happy to be here. This is TMS Roundtable Global. We are all over the world and I'm happy. And I'm always happy to see Rose. Good morning there in Australia, Rose. Uh, good morning, Tova. Good morning. <laughs> and thank you, Bill, for joining us. I'd just like to introduce Dr. Bill Watson. He, he works from at the Rochester University in New York, and he works in the epileptic clinic. Now, epilepsy for me was always an organic problem, as far as I knew, as a nurse. And then I was fortunate enough to meet Bill once in Halifax at Dr. Alan Abbas's seminar. And he started telling us how it was a, a somatic problem. And it's very fascinating. And I really like to welcome you, Bill. Thank, Thank you for you. coming. Thank you. So good to be here. Yeah. Can you sort of give us a, a bit of background about how epilepsy or seizures, actually, even the words are all different. You know, like we had fitting, we had seizures, we have psycho seizures, like we have a whole range of things. And, you know, as a mother, you know, we had to make sure our children's temperature was kept down because they might have a fit. Uh, in labor ward, we had to make sure that the delivery was slow and even so that the baby didn't have a fit. Uh, and then I worked in the areas of say, alcoholism with patients and I'm seeing patients with seizures. And I'm looking at the whole picture and thinking that they must have had a head injury. And then I met Bill and I found that they can have it from stress and anxiety. Wow. Can you sort of give a little bit of a, a better clinical background about how this all happens? Sure, I'd be, ha I'd be happy to. Um, I got involved in the epilepsy program because they, the, the founder of our program at the University of Rochester Medical Center is a strong believer in the importance of the emotional component of healthcare and how it in, impacts and affects patients and, uh, and the need for attention to that in our comprehensive epilepsy center. Uh, so what we do in our center is uh, get referrals typically from neurologists or sometimes primary care physicians of patients whose seizures are not responding to medication. So they're pharmacologically unresponsive, also known as intractable seizures. They just keep happening no matter what treatment has been thrown at it. And so we bring them into the hospital and hook them up to an EEG for 24 seven while they're in the hospital bed admitted to the unit for up to several days, up to two weeks if we need to, to kind of wait for their typical seizures to show up. We taper, we taper their meds and uh, wait for the seizures to arrive so that we can see what the EEG is doing during the seizure. And we find that when we do this at our epilepsy center and other epilepsy centers around the country and around the world, uh, about a third of these patients will have normal EEGs during their convulsive seizure. Two thirds of the patients wow. have telltale EEG signs that help us know about the very complex and complicated seizure disorder that they have. And then we proceed to devise, you know, cutting edge neurological treatments for them, current medications or other uh, other interventions, but for the third of the patients whose seizures are normal and there's no other medical explanation for these episodes of unconsciousness or numbness or convulsing or passing out, for these folks, we think of this as a, um, a disorder caused by, the, by kind of emotional stress. The way I talk about it with patients is uh, these episodes that you're having, these symptoms are your body's way of letting you know something's troubling you, something you're probably not even fully aware of. And your body's speaking about the fact that there's something on your mind. And often these are patients who have learned early on to pay more attention to the needs of others than to their own needs. Mm -hmm. They really are oriented to caring for others. And they tend to underestimate and neglect any internal signs of distress or discomfort or problem, taking the position that many of us can take off in their life, which is, I'd rather I have the problem than they have the problem. Mm -hmm. So I'll ignore me and I'll take care of them. And then I'll feel better, because I do, I feel good when I take care of people and I can see that I've made a difference in their lives. 
which is a great way to be up to a point. But if that's the only real way you have of moving through life is to just noticing others and all you do with your own issues or your own feelings or your own concerns or your own warning signals is ignore them, then over time, what's going to happen is that's going to build up inside and create some kind of problem. And one of the ways that can go is into physical manifestations of tension, anxiety, and distress, even to the point of passing out, even to the point of muscle discharge and seizure-like episodes. Wow. So it's really a muscle discharge rather than an electrical um yeah, that's a way to think of it, yeah. right? These are these are happening not because of an electrical storm in the brain, which is one way we think about epilepsy. Epilepsy Ooh. is a chaotic misfiring of neurons in the brain because of some problem in the brain, some physical problem in the brain that creates these uh, electrical storms that then show up in the body with convulsions generated by activities in the brain. Uh, these seizures, the psychogenic non-epileptic attacks or non-epileptic spells or pseudo seizures or non-epileptic seizures, they have various names. Um, these kinds of spells are caused not by a electrical storm, but you might think of it as an emotional storm. And usually it's an yeah. emotional storm that we're trying to quell. So there's emotional storms coming up from old feelings, hurts that are uncomfortable. Uh and part of us is trying to do this with it. Mm -hmm. Would a clinician know, like if, if I was working in a different area and a patient had a seizure, would I know, observing the patient, that they would look different to a, um, a patient that was actually not having a pseudo-seizure? Um, would, would, like, would the sorry. lack of, you know, we used to have um, grand males and petty males and all that we used to grade them like that, and mm -hmm. we don't anymore. But um, well, we kind of still do. But you're wondering if those seizures would look different than a, a psychogenic event? They would. They do typically, not always, though. I mean, this is one of the reasons it's really helpful to know what the EEG is doing during the spell, because some yeah. of them can can look very, very electrical, but but oftentimes there's a distinct difference. There's a uh, there's a Oftentimes, patients who are having a psychogenic spell uh, will have their eyes closed during the spell. Oh. And whereas the majority of time, patients with epileptic events have their eyes open well, during the seizure. Yeah. Yeah. Now, again, there's exceptions to that, but the large majority. Um, yeah. Wow. There's, a, there's um, often a stiffening in, in, the, in the grand mal seizure. There's a stiffening phase, whereas well, I can't tell where my camera is. There's yeah. a, st a stiffening phase that gets very, very stiff, and then a jerking phase, a rhythmic bilateral jerking phase, which is the classic grand mal seizure. And that typically doesn't happen that way in a psychogenic event. There's a tightening, but not usually a mm -hmm. stiffening, yeah. for what that's worth. Mm, mm. Yeah, well, that's what I was wondering, because now, looking back, I mean, I haven't seen a patient with a seizure for a long time, but I'm just thinking they all varied in actual fact now that I go to, when I when I reflect on it, that th there was different types. And also, sometimes you walk in and the seizure's already happening, so you don't, you haven't seen the the beginning of it, you know, like the right. aura. Would, right. would a, would a, um, would a psychogenic seizure patient have an aura? Put it that way. They can. Well. Sure, they can. They can. You can tell, you know, it's not unusual for patients with psychogenic events to be able to tell when they're coming. It's also That's not. Right. A, yeah. It's also. I got to I gotta get a wireless one of these things. Um, <laughs> it's also not unusual, though, for patients who are having psychogenic events to not be able to tell. They, they just come out of the blue. They just hit. They're doing mm -hmm. one thing. And the next thing they know, they're on the ground waking up. Mm -hmm. That happens too. Wow. Right. I'm going to ask a question. I don't know a whole lot about this, and it's sort of very interesting to me where Rose has had more experience being a nurse and, and a midwife. And um, so I imagine that even someone with, you know, uh, chemical mental health problems or, you know, neurological where it's, there's really a chemical imbalance and they, you know, they have to have their medicine. 
I imagine that any of the work that we're all doing with the with ISTDP or chronic pain or working with the mind body would have would be able to help even a person live with the part of their brain that is epileptic or the part of their life that they might lose control. It's like they get to understand the part of them that they do you, do you see what I'm saying? I imagine that this is an option to help anyone. You know, if when someone's getting radiation, I said you still need to to understand how you're, you know, it's our response to the epilepsy. It's our response, the family's response, the doctor's response, how we feel about ourselves. How can we live a functional life? So that's just more things that I that I'm not a hundred percent sure about, but I imagine you were brought into this. Um, not as a straight psychiatrist, but more of a of a holistic, and that's what I'm yeah. seeing. It's, it's something something's changing because when I grew up, epilepsy was epilepsy, and bipolar was bipolar, and sociopathic was sociopathic, and now we're we're seeing the bridge. That's what I when I'm hearing about you, I thought there's a bridge happening here, and there's something bigger for the people and the families of of epileptic patients. What, what would you like, can you, can you respond to that? Oh yeah, for sure. Any, any chronic illness, any chronic physical illness is gonna have an emotional impact and a relational impact on the individual and the family. And one of the things uh, we um, try to pay attention to is how the family is adjusting to and responding to the presence of an illness in their family, whether it's um, epilepsy that's not being well controlled, whether it's cancer, whether it's myasthenia gravis, whether it's, um, you know, lupus or whatever, mm -hmm. uh, there's, um, there's an impact on the family. And we try to help family members uh, put the illness in its place. There's a tendency, I think, on all families, understandably so, when you, a loved one uh, has a serious illness, it spites anxiety in the family. And yeah. the family tends to you know, rally around the patient mm -hmm. initially, understandably and appropriately. And then, but that can take on a life of its own where now everything in the family is determined by the illness. And everything in the family is determined by the symptoms. Um, and there's no sense of freedom. There's no sense of being able to uh, retain the aspects of the family functioning that was so gratifying from before. And everything sort of goes frozen, which is appropriate when in the, in the crisis moment. But what happens is that that kind of frozen position stays in place after the patient gets home, after they're on track, after they're they're reaching a stable point. So we want to help families um, kind of break out of that sense of being dominated by the illness and being able to put the illness in its place, give it all the attention that it's due, that it needs, but not more than it needs, and not let the life be completely consumed by the presence of that illness. Yeah. Look, up. Uh on one of your articles, or one of the really, really lovely articles, you you explained about ex exactly that, talking to the family about this illness and how it becomes difficult for the uh, family and for the patient, I gather, to actually accept that it's uh, um, a pseudo seizure. That it's almost like they want to have a, a grand mal instead of a pseudo seizure. W Am I right yeah, about that? Abs well, absolutely. Um, it's, it makes more sense. We, we, we all are familiar with physical illness, and we're all familiar with how medication can help with that. Uh, we're, not, we're much less familiar than the, with the impact of emotions on our bodies. Mm. And the idea that we can pass out and convulse because of purely emotional factors is like ridiculous. I mean, who ever heard of such a thing? Well, we've heard of this for thousands of years, actually. Uh, yeah, exactly. Medicine has known about this uh, for thousands of years, and so, but uh, it's not widely understood in the in the broader population. So, it, uh, what we do in trying to talk to the families about this is help them understand how this can happen, and also help them understand that it's entirely treatable. These kinds of episodes, this sort of illness, is fortunately a symptom that can be completely recovered from. You can. Uh, once you begin to allow yourself to deal with your emotional life internally in a healthy way, these things will resolve completely. And they can mm. and they do. Not always and not for everybody and sometimes mm. with a great deal of effort. Um, but 
uh, if somebody can recognize that these are actually indeed being bought on by emotional factors within them and can do the hard work to address that, the odds of them getting much, much better, if not completely recovered, really, really are mm -hmm. high. If they can't, yeah. though, and they keep looking for other solutions in the medical mm -hmm. field, then the likelihood that they'll do the work on themselves to get better is low. Could I just ask you, you said originally that one third of the patients have pseudo seizures. One, thir one third to qualify, one third of patients with intractable seizures. So I wanna yeah. make sure that we're not thinking a third of all patients with seizures, because that's not right. It's only yeah. people that have sort of serious, seizures that are so serious, they're just not responding to medication. Yeah, so w what is one third in quantifiable sort of, how many patients would you have at your clinic per annum, for example, and what would one third mean? Does it mean 20 or does it mean 200? I, it was a fair question. So the way I think of it is per week. So we have about, okay. we have about eight admissions a week, eight yeah. or nine admissions a week on our unit of people that are coming in to have their seizures evaluated. So about a third of those every week. So that's two to three, sometimes four, sometimes five are, uh, yeah. will, will be psychogenic. And the others yeah. will prove to be epileptic. On occasion, on occasion mm -hmm. we can't figure it out because maybe they don't have the seizure while they're on the unit. Mm -hmm. But um, most of the time we do. Okay, so two or three a week. That's a fair few. So how many overall, uh, how many patients would, you have eight a week and so they would be, no, they're only intractable ones. So how right. many do you have overall? Well, clinic. so if we if we multiply eight by fifty two, uh, or fifty yeah. to make it round, uh, so that's uh, what is that two hundred? No, wait, four hundred. That's okay. four hundred, right? So a third of that, so one hundred and fifty ish, one hundred and seventy five. Uh, okay, they're the intractable. How many do you have in the clinic overall? Um, of of uh, well, these are the pa uh, well in, in terms of the non intractable mm -hmm. epilepsy patients. Yeah, I don't yeah. know actually. I don't know. Oh, okay. Okay, I, I was just sort of wondering. What percentage of the whole population? Yeah, that's that's a knowable number, and it's in the research literature. But I'm I don't have it at my fingertips, yeah, unfortunately. Yeah, because being an ISTDP therapist, I found that a lot of people who have um, problems that have been taught that um, are supposed to be um, uh, um, I've lost my train of thought um, is something that that isn't um, somatic. Um, their somatic, their symptoms go down with the therapy. So I'm just wondering if the general population would also improve with the therapy. That was all. That's right. where I'm coming from. Yeah. Well, I think that I think it's true that um, it's it was important to understand. I think that um, mind body symptoms can show up in the form. Uh, it, it can take many forms. One of the ones we see, of course, in the epilepsy program are, are symptoms that are concerning for seizures. So people passing out, convulsing, yeah. Um, yeah. losing consciousness, having a s sort of zoning spells. These are all things that are out of the norm of daily behavior and interfere with their functioning. And then when you look at it, you think, oh, could this be epilepsy? But it's also true that there's all, a host of other uh, problems that can show up as a result of mind-body issues, including uh, fogginess in the thinking, numbness, mm -hmm. paralysis, uh, pain. Yeah. Uh, you've, you've yeah. done a lot with pain, I know, on your program. Uh, you get abdominal pain, uh, uh, GI problems, IBS, <laughs> yeah. uh, fatigue, yeah. weakness, gait problems, speech problems, eating problems, mm -hmm. uh, choking, mm -hmm. uh, inability to swallow, all these kinds of things. There are possible medical routes to all of these, and there are possible psychogenic routes to all of these, and it's important mm -hmm. to sort of ferret out which is which. Yeah, yeah. Do you see the patients, do you give the diagnosis and then they go and find their own therapist, or is there a sort of an outpatient clinic? We do have yeah. an out, we do have an outpatient clinic, and I have a you know a number of patients that I treat, and so do my colleagues that are doing the same, a postdoc fellow as well. So we have a fellowship in functional neurological disorders here at the university where we're training psychologists, uh, advanced uh, psychologists in, in this uh, discipline. 
So we have an outpatient clinic. Uh, many of our referrals though for our program are from several hours away because we're a regional center. So in those mm -hmm. cases, I have to refer them to therapists in their local community. Mm -hmm. uh, some of them have been in therapy already. And if it's, some that they, if, if it's someone that they like and work well with, then we try to make contact with that therapist to discuss the diagnosis and make treatment recommendations. If, uh, if they're not, we encourage them to find a therapist locally for them through you know, inquiring with their mm -hmm. primary care doc or their neurologist or, yeah. or whatever yeah. resource they can use. Are you unique? Are you unique in America? Is your clinic unique in America? No, no. There are other there are other epilepsy centers around the country and around the world, including in the UK. I know uh, that do this kind of monitoring, long term video EEG monitoring, and all of those centers are familiar with this phenomenon. Mm -hmm. You can't you yeah. can't evaluate intractable epilepsy without encountering patients whose episodes are being generated. From emotional rather than neurological reasons. Yeah, yeah. And do they treat them um, the same way as you do? That's my question. Well, there's, there's, yeah, there's a number of different approaches that can be taken, uh, from cognitive behavioral therapy approaches to sort of broadly psychodynamic approaches to ISTDP, you know, mm -hmm. an experiential, acce accelerated, yeah. mm -hmm. experiential approaches. Um, yeah. Uh, I've been worth working with the Epilepsy Center for over 25 years and treating patients with a reasonable degree of success and failure, I suppose. And I encountered ISTDP as a modality to address this population about eight years ago. Uh, so, uh, and I've, I've found that to be um, quite persuasive as a, a, a way to understand how these kinds of symptoms can develop and ways to address them therapeutically. Yeah. Bill, do you yeah. think that, um, I mean, as far as I know, ep people are born with epilepsy, so it's a, something neurological is just not balanced in their, in their brain, and then, I mean, they're born with it, or is it something that does come from, or are you finding it does come from childhood trauma? Well, now, epilepsy, epileptic seizures, you're right, can be something that you're born with. It also can be something that you acquire, and it's not uncommon for us to not know for sure where it came from because the it can start anywhere from infancy to adolescence yeah. to young adulthood mm -hmm. or adulthood. You can suddenly start having seizures. Most commonly, it's mm -hmm. uh, um, infancy through adolescence is when it'll typically start to show up. But if you have a brain injury, you have a mm -hmm. you know get into a car accident and you have a severe head injury, uh, the injury to the brain itself, the bruise on the brain, uh, can mm -hmm. result in seizures. Uh, ongoing. Yeah. Uh, sometimes certain kinds of illnesses can result in damage to the brain, uh, mm -hmm. brain tumors, obviously. Can you um, ever, is this ever been known to be reversed? Something like the, that? The, the when you say that, that should mean like that. Like, to, like what, again, you know, I'm wanting to believe through, again, it's a little bit, um, more uh, of my, uh, what's the word? Um, you know, like not wanting to be in reality, wanting to be like, anything can be fixed. Anything can be, if somebody really wanted to get better, that if their mind, you know, the law of attraction and the, you know, like there's, there's a biology of belief. There's a biology of, mm -hmm. and this is a chemical reaction. When I laugh, when I cry, when I think negative, when I think positive, this is a chemical reaction. So what I think I'm bumping up against is that there are some mental health conditions. I don't even think I'd call epilepsy mental health, would you? What would you Right, call? I would call epilepsy a neurological problem. So, so do, are neurological problems, can they be reversed depending on the personality and the family and the, the, you know, the players? Most commonly, uh, first of all, I would say for people with epilepsy, you absolutely can uh, bring your seizures under complete control. There are plenty oh. of patients with epilepsy who on medication uh, have no seizures for years and are quite successful in their families and in their careers. Wow. Uh, that's not uncommon. Wow. Uh, that uh, another intervention that we will do is brain surgery. If you can, uh, sometimes wow. you can remove the epileptic place in the brain, whether it's the, the lesion or the or the damage to the brain, yeah. a little bit of injury to the brain, if you can remove that, there's enough 
good stuff in the brain to compensate. And uh, many you're patients- talking about, You're talking about the, the um, hold, hold, it, hold it. You're talking about the ability for the brain, um, what do we call that? But, Plasticity. Yeah. Is that what you're, is that what we're talking about here? Partly, yes, yes. The brain, the brain, when when there's it loses function in one part, other parts can compensate, and we mm. find that oftentimes, uh, of course, we evaluate very carefully for who's qualified, for who's makes a good candidate for the brain surgery, uh, and if the area is is a very specific area, small enough that that we can do the surgery without creating problems in other areas of a mental and emotional and physical functioning, then the patients often will do quite well. In fact, we had we had a um, one one of our students who was very interested in in in, in um, knowing more about epilepsy and brain surgery himself. In adolescence, had gone through brain surgery for epilepsy successfully, and he was getting his master's degree with us. Wow, um, which was okay. quite so something. it's totally successful. They wouldn't it wouldn't come back in another spot. Right. No epilepsy. Right. Epilepsy. We're, so there's there's epilepsy, which is a medical neurological illness. Then there's yeah. psychogenic attacks, which is a mental and emotional phenomenon where the emotional tension is getting converted into a physical symptom that has no medical, uh, biological, physiological basis. Right. So I want to make sure we're talking about two separate things when we're talking about these kinds of seizures. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And and, yeah, well, and, and, I, and the and the emotional uh, factors that give a rise to psychogenic or pseudo seizures, as they're sometimes known, these factors are quite treatable. And then, to your earlier question, yes, you can get complete reversal and recovery. And I've seen we've seen this happen uh, with yeah. successful treatment when people can begin to allow themselves to experience their emotional wow. life without suppressing and sitting and all, on at all, and without getting flooded by anxiety, which then goes into the body and tension and spells, if they can do that, then their seizures mm, go away. When yeah. you can feel the feeling, you don't need to get anxious about it. This is, yes. you need to quote, well, Barbara, to quote that and put it on a big billboard. <laughs> <laughs> Barbara's actually given us the background yeah. here. Uh, and look at this, to bring it up. Yeah, yeah. Barbara's, Barbara is uh, someone we know, and she's um, been a scientist studying different uh, different things in the in the medical community. I'm not exactly sure, but she's quoting some some information that it's fairly common, you know, epilep epilepsy. And I think that she's saying, though it's an uncomfortable topic, it's one that you know, so. But what I, how I want to add to that and 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 com and complement what Rosie said is that what again what I grew up with was that this was this was an uncomfortable topic and what I think what your center is doing and what your center is saying is that this is something that this is a center you know this is not something that was around 20 30 years ago it is it is it is we're not hiding from it we're not running from it we're not putting our child away, we are actively um, integrating um, medicine and psychology to find a solution. And I, I feel so, I feel very hopeful. There's a lot to be hopeful about here. Yeah. 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 What I think the, the, go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, I was just going to say the downside of it is that, that um, I, I presume it's the same everywhere. You've got to notify the, um, the uh, transport people and uh, you've got to get a clearance or the doctor is is forced to actually notify the, the transport people that the person can't drive and their license is taken from them. And uh, I presume there could be problems at work with patients having a seizure at work and then maybe they're, they're dismissed. I don't yep. know. I don't, for I sure guess. happens, absolutely. Yeah, so there's all this background um, stuff going on for people. Mm -hmm. So th it would be a shame. Th there would be a sense of shame about it, wouldn't there? That, yes. you know, I better keep this secret. Yes. Yes. And you... sometimes, right, and some the other the shame is compounded when, uh, when they learn that there's actually not a medical basis for these events. So there's nothing neurologically wrong with their brain. 
They don't have yeah. epilepsy. Wow. And and then they go to, oh, so you mean I'm doing this to myself? You mean this is all in my head? Uh, do you mean I'm making this up uh, or faking it? Because pseudo seizures means false seizures. You think I'm being right. false? I don't really like and the name pseudo. It means, yeah. No, we don't really either. I mean, I think it's a it's a historical term and and patients that have encountered it and have been diagnosed with it and have come to understand what it means and what it doesn't mean, that's fine. But we, we tend to avoid using that term just because of the downside of the pseudo part that could be misleading mm -hmm. to make the patient, the family mm -hmm. members think they're somehow faking it, which they're not. I want, I mm -hmm. want to stress that a psychogenic events are involuntary. They're not under one's direct conscious control. Mm -hmm. One of the ways I explain this to patients and their families is that our uh, the way our body uh, responds to our emotional state is involuntary and not under our direct conscious control. Is it, the, the, is it the unconscious? Well, what the way here's the way I think about it. All emotions show up in the body one way or another. When they do that, we don't find that to be a problem. You know, you see an old friend who moved away and you go to the grocery store and it turns out they're in town. You didn't know it, that you run into them in the grocery store. And when you see them, you run into them, you're surprised and you're delighted. Your body responds. What does your face do when you see that friend in the vegetable aisle? What does your face do? It well, breaks, lights up. breaks yeah. into a smile, lights up. Yeah, yeah. Well, no, yeah. when your face lights up, are you doing that on purpose? Are you making it up? So my body's expressing my emotion in a somatic way. Yeah. You're not doing it on purpose. Even even the question, am I doing that on purpose automatic, is a weird question. My nervous system is doing that. It's it's automatic. It, it, it's what we think of as a voluntary. This would be voluntary, right? We can smile or not smile. We think of it as voluntary, but the way our body responds to emotional states is involuntary and automatic. Like the belly, is why, the belly ache I got when you showed up at two minutes to 10. <laughs> yes, that was involuntary. <laughs> I had to say it. I had to make you real. <laughs> right. No, that's right. I, I, all, I, I run my I run on my own time clock, which is a little slow sometimes. Yeah, it's thrilling. It's thrilling that I mean, like really that you took time for, to come to the show. It really is exciting. And I think what's 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 what um, you know, Rose and I come across you know bipolar with some of our our, our clients, and um, not not even depression as much, but. Uh, Again, I'm 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 a little taken aback by the by the whole epilepsy department and and, and having a center. I'm I'm very excited about medicine and what's I wouldn't even call it medicine. I mean, you're you're a psychiatric department or a well, we're at a medical center, so we've medical. got all the departments. Okay. You know, okay. Rheumatology, okay. immunology, okay. psychiatry, okay. neurology, all the ologies. And you're you're an integrative doctor. You're integrating. Yeah, we have we in fact. Um, some of the people that I work with are founding are, are founding uh, founders of the field of medical family therapy, where we try to really bring together um, uh, sort of the an understanding of emotional functioning in systems and how that interacts Good. with medical functioning, physical functioning, medical disorders. Beautiful. Good. Yeah. But, but that's what I was trying to say before that even people with a, um, a diagnosis, say, of epilepsy that need medication they also would benefit from the um, emotional um, healing that they well, need. Absolutely, right. There's a, there's a strong need for, for integrated care, for yeah. this, for attending to the psychosocial aspect of medical illness. And it's yeah. far, been far too often under attended to. I think, there's, I think that's changing in the field. Um, and yeah. we try to co-locate providers, mental health providers in family medicine, women's health, uh, neurology, pediatrics, um, internal medicine, family medicine, all throughout the hospital. We, we've got calls for more uh, providers to be supplied for other, other departments. Re rehab medicine, as you might imagine, people get an injury and are suddenly quadriplegic uh, or paraplegic. And you can imagine the need for emotional interventions and support and, and family intervention for those folks. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, with my nursing staff, I would always say um, the mental health of the patient is more important often than the than the giving the um, the medications really, because the mental health keeps the balance in the body going, right. no matter what the issue is. 
as we know, yeah. th there's not a direct correlation between the severity of the illness and the severity of the suffering. That's right. Exactly. Right. Well, you can yeah. have you can you can be not all that ill and suffer a lot, and you can be horribly ill and have relatively less suffering, depending on a variety of things in terms yeah. of how you manage it and how and how that, you're supported yeah. around you, what kind of context you're in. Yeah, yeah, and that and that's why I think that you know, like mental health, for example, in nursing, is so important because it needs to be almost the foundation of when you know um, when you're working in a surgical area or a medical area or whatever area you're working in, the mental health of the patient and your own is um, is of primary importance because that will help the recovery program as well. You know, like getting a patient out of bed if their mental health status is not good. They're not wanting to, you know, they become depressed because of their um, epilepsy, for example, and uh, and they want to give up hope. Well, it's their mental health that needs to be attended to, as well as the um, as well as the medication. Yeah, yeah. You know, folks, I've just noticed that we've got no questions. Um. I think have we been watching, but I think it's a very it's 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 a very specific topic. It's a very specific yeah. topic, and that's why I asked Bill. You know, we were you before you got into this department? Were you working in psychiatry? Or were you working with psychology? You know, you obviously were drawn to ISTDP, which is a very unique, you know, way of of dealing with with the mind. It's it's very body mind. So can maybe tell us a little bit about your past and and actually how did you get how did you manage to uh to meet um professor alan abbas and and uh, and get into istdp very interesting question mm -hmm. tova mm -hmm. yeah well I, I i learned about alan's work from howard schubner actually oh. who, who i met when he came to rochester uh to give a talk at the family medicine center on chronic pain treatments and because i was working already at that point in epilepsy with a, uh, working a lot with the psychogenic patients. When he was talking about psychogenic pain, I was very interested in what he had to say. So we got to chatting afterwards and we kind of struck up a correspondence uh, uh, and I was interested in learning about his group treatments for pain, uh, his, his 28 day, four week mm -hmm. group treatment. Mm -hmm. And I was interested in trying to adapt that to the work we do here with our epilepsy patients. Wow. And along the way, when I was chatting with him one day about uh, some aspect of, of, of his program, he said, oh, you know, I've rewritten my book. I went up to this conference in Halifax and it just, it just blew my mind and I just rewrote the whole thing. It's so much better now. <sighs> so he was so enthusiastic about it. And he said, you know, I'm going back for the second time this fall. The topic is on somatoform disorders. And that's all he needed to say. I said, okay, I'm there. <sighs> so I went up and but that was looked back. Years ago. That was in 2013, I think. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, uh, uh, yeah, and then uh, do you still go to the immersions every yes. year? Yeah, I'm kind of hooked now. You know, be, be, yeah. <laughs> become part of a community. I've been. In, I'm just finishing up three years of core training uh, with Alan yeah. and uh, Joel Town in Halifax, yeah. which has been a, just a great experience. Yeah. So, do you it's have an interest to to treat non epileptic patients because you have the skills and or you just feel like that your work is full with with the epileptic center epileptic center. well I, I have a joint appointment in psychiatry and epilepsy i'm sorry psychiatry and neurology and so mm -hmm. uh i also do a lot of work in family therapy so i i teach family therapy skills to the psychiatry residents i uh, work with our master's degree program in family therapy in the Department of Psychiatry. So I, I have a faculty practice over there as well. So I, I kind of have, wear a couple of different hats. Yeah. Um, wow. And I also do some phys physician coaching, trying to help doctors polish and perfect their ability to relate successfully psychosocially to their patients, looking Beautiful. at how they communicate. Bedside manner. Remember that term? Yeah. Yeah. We have a whole pro we have a whole program of that of coaching. Uh, Going Excellent. department by department and providing coaching to all the faculty, observing their interviews, giving them feedback about how to how to polish that up. So yeah. important. So so at this point, I do find that my uh, ISTDP work uh, and thinking filters into my family therapy Call work. It. I also yeah. do I also do group work. I run training groups, process groups, emotionally focused groups, group therapy. Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, really focus actually on trainees, mental health trainees. Um, 
and my ISTP work right. uh, filters in is there as well, looking to see about uh, how we can help all of us become as fully in touch with and aware of and free to experience our emotional life as possible so that we have more information about what's going on inside of us so that we have what we need to make good decisions. This is, this is, yeah. this is so important. So I was going to say, you know, do you see a chronic, you know, what, what do you think about some of the chronic pain patients that you might have seen or, you know, I mean, I, I just, I just think that, that what you just said, if you could repeat that, the, the, if, if we could just be as, if we can give ourselves permission to be as fully aware of what's going on for us in our emotional life, it gives us information about what's happening inside of us. And that yeah. information allows us to make good decisions. When we don't know what's going on inside of us, when we ignore it, then the emotions have a way of deciding things for us. Yes. And we find ourselves withdrawing, shutting down, going flat, getting irritable, not knowing mm -hmm. why any of those things are happening or people, mm -hmm. Or we'll feel fine and people around us will be miserable with us and we'll say what's your problem right. when we're the ones creating it because right. we don't we, we have no idea what's going on inside right. of us because we we're tuning out enough like defenses covering up what's really happening right yeah yeah well that's that's right isn't it uh, like that that whole idea of of covering up your feelings covering up your sadness or your anger um it's going to come out somewhere and it's sort of a Sure. It's like um, a kettle. Yeah, it boils right. over. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Or, yeah. or a, uh, uh, I think Elizabeth Bowman has the a metaphor of a um, pressure cooker. Sit. Right. Yeah. <laughs> a pressure yeah. cooker. Right. So the the, th the things bolted down, but if you don't, if the valve escape valve isn't working right, then the whole thing will blow. Yeah. as the pressure builds yeah. up escape and the valve. heat under yeah. yeah you need that escape valve and if you don't mm -hmm. have it and so actually the the symptoms can are essentially functioning as an escape oh. valve right um, yeah yeah exactly and which is but not, not a maladaptive one though unfortunately. i'm going to ask you a little bit of a, of a more medical question and I'm, I'm i'm happy for your honest answer do you do you think chronic pain is is something that people should accept as normal and and do you feel like the majority, I mean, the majority of doctors, they don't, they treat chronic pain as if there's nothing they can do and it's something people have to live with, which that right. to me means it's chronic and it can't yeah. be taken care of. And right. I'd like to know how you feel about that. And if, yeah. you know, you probably have some colleagues that say that and it doesn't mean they're, something's wrong with what they're saying. It means that they're just limited and have tunnel vision in what they're saying. And I, I think we're we're coming we're butting heads with so many patients that hear from their doctors and they don't believe Rose and I who, you know, we have eighty years of experience between us, you know, and they it's 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 hard for people to believe that their chronic pain can be healed or in process of a journey. Yeah, no, I would agree. I, I'm familiar with Howard's work and uh, he's uh, one of the most articulate and persuasive uh, people out there in my uh, view in, in helping us understand how it is that the brain can create these symptoms and sensations of debilitating pain that can render somebody almost paralyzed and non-functional because it's too painful to move or too painful to sit mm -hmm. or stand or walk. And how can that even be? And that can be such a puzzling thing that it's, it sort of seems ridiculous on the face of it. So the idea that our mind can create that um, is just absurd for all of us, right? Yeah. But when you get into it and begin to understand it, you can see that there's a more of a connection between what's going on in our minds and what's going on in our emotional life and what's going on in our body than we are really aware of. Yeah. Well, I mean, we can have a computer malfunction and we don't, we call in the technician for that. Mm -hmm. That's right. So we, so we accept that. Yeah. So I do think that uh, when when somebody's uh, dealing with chronic pain, it behooves us to be more aware of uh, sort of uh, the emotional factors that can play in. And I do think that uh, sadly, there's a uh, for some reason that I I don't quite understand myself. There, there there's there's a slowness to accept that that's even possible. Mm -hmm. on the part of a lot of providers who deal with chronic pain, mm -hmm. pain yeah, patients. Exactly. Do you think um, that you're, um, I'm sorry, Rose, go ahead. 
I just want to put it out there. I think that there's quite a few therapists and psychologists actually with us this morning. If anyone's got any questions to um, to Bill, I know that when I met him in Halifax, he he was a hive of, of information and background and and understanding. Please put any questions up to him now while we've got him with us because um, he really has got a deep, deep understanding of um, of how ISTDP works and helps patients. And he, and he also, he, he has a way of actually speaking to patients that they understand. He, he's saying how it's difficult for um, patients to understand, but I know as he describes what's happening for the patient, that, that an understanding comes for them. And I think that he's quite successful in helping patients to cross over. So anyone who has patients, mm -hmm. That they're finding difficult to get them to cross over. Mm -hmm. Put your questions to Bill now, please, while we've got him, because and, has... and I would be happy to anticipate a few of those and just say a little bit about what, some, what I think some of the key messages are to give to patients and their families about this kind Fantastic. of problem. Yeah, would you like me thank to? You. Um, so, what is the name of the clinic? There's a woman, Heather. Hi, Heather. I've not met you before. What is the name of the clinic, Bill, that you work at? Oh, at the Strong Epilepsy Center at the University of Rochester Medical Center. Wow. And yeah. um, is it, it, can I, this is a little personal, but you can tell me to lighten up if, if it's too personal. <laughs> People have told me that before. Um, do you, are your colleagues, do they think you're a little bit like, uh, you know, you're, because you're, you're, you're very holistic. You're very integrative. You're very um, uh, um, alternative and very, but what a balance. What a beautiful balance, psychiatry, neurologic, neuro neurological, and ISTDP. I mean, it's beautiful. It's beautiful. Uh, my, I, I find I, I don't I don't get much flack. The um, the our, our neurologists are really keyed into these sort of emotional dynamics with our patients, and they we worked closely together on these on yeah. these patients that are on the epilepsy unit inpatient for these evaluations. And, and, and they, they're they very sad, they pick up on this stuff. They ask me and I, you know, I, I do some teaching with the neurology residents uh, and, uh, and and work closely with the, our neurology uh, epilepsy attendings uh, mm -hmm. faculty. And uh, mm -hmm. people welcome my input and my colleague John Langford's input and our fellow Dan Milstein's input um, and, uh, and others. So, and then in psychiatry, there's a strong, uh, strong one of the strongest, I think, psychosocial programs in psychiatry in the country. In our residency, wow. I teach uh, family therapy and emotional process yeah. to the residents. Nice. Good. Well, please expand for the therapists watching about bridging that gap, please, before you leave yeah. us, because okay. it's so terribly important. And also, as the patients who would have um, psycho seizures if they can actually listen in and and collect the, the information and let it sink into their hearts that yeah. that they're okay yeah yeah one of the ways I when when we give when we deliver the diagnosis to the patient at the end of the admission having found that the seizures that they had on this on the unit when we could look at the EEG during the seizures and see that they're normal we give them the good news at the end of the admission that hey that, you know those three seizures you had in the last few days here your EEG is perfectly normal, both during the seizures and between your seizures. We see no sign of epilepsy. You have a healthy brain. Wow. So that's good news. You don't need to be on these seizure meds, which can make you feel dopey wow. or logy. And we can get you off of those. And you do not have epilepsy. And of course, the next question is going to be, well, so then what are these? So they kick it over to me. And I say, well, what, my way of talking about it is, I understand these problems as being a way that your body is letting you know that something's troubling you. Wow. something you're probably not even aware of. Um, these uh, our, our emotions show up in our bodies in ways that are involuntary and not under, under our direct conscious control. These are not something that's happening because you're making it up. You're not faking it. You don't want these to be happening. You're not doing them on purpose. You're not imagining them. These are happening. These are real things that are actually happening. Um, does this make any sense? So then I sort of invite them to respond. Yeah. And that brings out the questions, the skepticism, the relief, the tears, sometimes mm -hmm. the irritation, like what? You, you're supposed to tell me what pill to take. Um, <laughs> yeah, don't, don't leave me alone with my emotions. No, no. 
So uh, then they'll say, well, so, but I, you know, when, I can understand sometimes these might happen because I get really stressed out, but a lot of times I'm feeling fine when they happen. So how can you tell me these are happening because of emotional factors in my life or stress or things like that? Because that's not happening. So well, one of the things I like to point out to patients is that the stress that's relevant for these kinds of symptoms is internal stress. It's not necessarily stress that's going on around you in your environment, which is why sometimes nothing at all can be going on. You could be having a relaxing evening and you'll have a spell. You go into a seizure. Uh, why might that be? Well, there's something triggering that at the time, but you're not aware of it. It's in the back of your mind. Why might that be? Well, all of us develop skills to ignore what's going on for us just to get through the day. And I would yeah. say from what we talked about when I met a couple of days ago with you and talked over your history, you had a lot of training in how to tune out what goes on for you because of what you've been through growing up, right? You remember that? Yeah. Right. So, so there's really good reason for you to have developed a way of managing your life by tuning out stuff that was overwhelming that you couldn't control or do anything about, right? Yeah. Okay. So you have you get to the point where you're very good at not noticing what's happening inside of you. Would you agree? Usually they do agree, or if they don't agree, their spouse is there, or pulling teeth to get them to say. Um, so then we talk about the ways in which uh, that ability to tune things out, while at the time was very useful, in the long run gets to a point where that's not working so well for them anymore. And that time is now. And so it's it's uh, it's not necessarily a specific stressor in their environment, it's something that's going on inside. Mm -hmm. One fellow told me indignantly, well, yeah, but I was in church the other day and I was just sitting there and had a seizure. You can tell me that, wh where's the stress there? <laughs> and so I said, well, so what, what were you doing as you were sitting in church? I was just sitting listening to the sermon. So what, I said, what was the sermon about? Well, he said, well, the preacher was talking about how God the Father loves us, his children. And I said, well, and what did that make you think of? Well, that made me think of my father who, oh. <laughs> and then he got it. So he's sitting there in the pew, not consciously in the front of his mind thinking about his dad, but in the back, it's sort of floating around. The way It happens to all of us, right? And that brought up feelings. So that happened to another woman said, I was on, out, out to dinner with friends on a lovely summer evening. Oh, tell me about your dinner. I was talking to Becky and Jim and they were back and <coughs> talking about their trip to Italy and how they were taking all these travels and how all these do these fun things all the time. And I'm sick of how they talk. And so, uh oh, <laughs> a lot of feelings were coming up as you were sitting talking with the two of them, right? Okay. So, so okay. there's usually some feelings there floating in the background that we tune out. There's a pretty extreme reaction to repressed feelings. Well, right, that's true. But we also often have can very have very strong reactions to repressed feelings. Why we repress why we repress them? The idea of being angry, saying that I'm angry, saying that I'm angry with you, fills me with nausea and dread and anxiety and panic, because I was beaten. And my dad was mad all the time and he drank and he beat me and my mother and my brothers. And to think that I'm mad ever, no way, not me. I want to throw up right now just thinking about it, right? Mm -hmm. That's that's what happens. That the, the extremity of our reaction to our own feelings has a lot to do often with the extremity of our experience right. growing up. In childhood. Yeah. In childhood. Like the and, and adolescence and adulthood. Abusive mm -hmm. relationships yeah. can happen all throughout. Yeah. Um, is there a correlation or do you think there's a correlation between early trauma and um, like around birth, around um, maybe four or five, seven or eight with pseudo seizures? Yes. And I want to hasten to add that I think there's a, I think a misperception sometimes that these sorts of symptoms are always a result of trauma and they're not. The research okay. shows that trauma uh, abuse is in the background of patients with psychogenic events somewhere between 20% and 70% of the time. So I just sort of average it out at around 50. So what that means is if you have a patient who's got psychogenic events and they say they don't have any background of trauma, believe them, they don't. Okay. But that's not the only way to develop this kind of problem. There's lots of ways to learn to turn out your, tune out your feelings. You could be 
in a family where you're told explicitly to not your feelings, the way you deal with stuff that bothers you is quit whining, suck it up and deal. Right. Uh, you could, yeah. you, you, there's lots of, you could, you could be, you could be in a family where a, 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 a parent is, uh, so much is exhibiting so much suffering that all your attention goes to them and you feel like you have to suck it up to take care of them. So you learn to suck it up and be a caretaker, which is a good thing up to a point. But then this is the point. You get things can become a problem if that's the main or only way you've learned. And that you yeah. find that, you know, dealing with your own feelings, you're paying attention to your own feelings, just not something you were taught. Yeah. Or you were taught, you, well, you were taught to keep quiet, in other words, weren't you? You were either taught to keep quiet or sometimes it's just you weren't taught at all. I mean, lots of people are not very good at knowing what to do with feelings at all, including mm -hmm. parents. And so you, if, you, if you're nearly never coached in like how to interpret your own feelings, how to put them into words, how to have the experience that when you do that, you feel better. Mm -hmm. You learn other things like being successful mm -hmm. or studying or competing or fighting. And that right. makes you feel better. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Barbara, what was Barbara yeah, sitting? Barbara here? saying is that she's making a point that that epilepsy is as prevalent as multiple sclerosis or trigeminal neuralgia, and I'm having a hard time believing that. Is that possible? I think it is. Sure. Mm -hmm. No, epilepsy is a, is a it, epilepsy is a common neurological disorder. There are lots of people with epilepsy. Yeah. Um, well, over the years, I've seen it many, mm -hmm. yeah, many but, times in all in all sorts of settings. But I want to highlight again and emphasize yeah. that what, what, what we're talking about when we're treating the emotional impact on the body, we're not talking about epilepsy. No. Right. We're, we're talking about, about an epileptic-like symptom. It looks like epilepsy, but it's not epilepsy. Right. right I want to yeah. make sure that we're clear about that. I'm making a point to our listeners that anyone with epilepsy still can create huge changes by also honoring and working on their psychological state when they're not having an epileptic attack and how they respond to the attacks and how the family responds. Well, and it's also possible to have both. You can have psychogenic events and epilepsy. We've seen patients with that. Right. Have you really? Mm -hmm. Wow. Typically, wow. typically they have a different form. You might have a patient with a staring spell, which is epileptic and maybe convulsive events that are psychogenic. That's, for example. Okay. But, yeah. Ooh. That happens too. There's such a variance, isn't there? Mm -hmm. Look, also, just while you've been talking, um, for any clinicians out there, um, where, you know, you sent me the the um, the dialogue with the um, with your other colleague about seizures and about... Um, I didn't print it out, unfortunately, so I can't reach it quickly. <laughs> Sorry. Um, where is that accessible if anyone wants to read it, any of the clinicians want to read it? Well, I, I, I was president of, yeah, there's a, there's a newsletter. I, you can, I mean, first, I'm happy yeah. to send my, the things that, the little things I've written up around, I'm happy to send that to anybody. Uh, you're also welcome to forward that to anybody from what I oh, sent to you. Thank you. Thank uh, you. But I was, yeah. uh, when I was uh, president of APA's uh, family division, I wrote uh, some news, some of the new newsletter articles when I was president uh, describing these kinds of mm -hmm. problems. It was one of my um, kind of mind body issues, one of my presidential themes that year. So I, I wrote about it there. We've also got a, uh, um, uh, a magazine uh, for professionals. Uh, wrote, my colleague John Langford and I wrote up a piece, a long piece for that. And uh, we also have a couple of book chapters and article chapters out. Oh, great. What book is that where you have chapters in, in books about mental health? Well, no, it's a, uh, my, my colleague John Langford was the first author on a, on a, you know, I should know the title of the book that we have a chapter in, um, okay. but I don't offhand. I'm an experience right now. Yeah. <laughs> So here, here, right here, we have memory lapses right here, sort of just a normal part of daily functioning. Not to be worried <laughs> it, about is, it. it is, yeah. Except when you get older, you think, oh my God, am I going down the drain? <laughs> yeah, I'm comforted by realizing I did that when I was 30. I would, no, teaching, really, you know, doing therapy, and and is not the same thing as being on a Facebook live show with Rose and Tova. So <laughs> it's you a little are. different. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I do uh, I want to ask an interesting question. So what other, I mean, I'm trying to just wrap my arm around, my, my, my head around all this. So there's epilepsy, which is a neurological disorder. And what else is up there with that? It's not different than bipolar or depression or... 
So she asked, what, what are the, some of the other neurological disorders? Is that yeah, what you mean? Yeah, that would be up there. Oh, I see where you're coming from. Yeah. yeah. But what, what else would be, would be something that you would be, could have the same um, paradigm is that maybe it's not always like, we know now that bipolar, we've met people that have dealt with their bipolar through body mind and literally taken it away. You know, we've even met MS people with MS and people with trigeminal neuralgia and people with cancer that have taken it away. So that's what is. Well, a lot of patients, a lot of patients with uh, with migraines, uh, will see neurologists for the treatment of their migraines. Mm -hmm. um, there's a number of uh, uh, there's gait difficulties, movement disorders, mm -hmm. um, speech problems that have a neurological root. Right. Um, uh, there's a number. We have a large uh, department of neurology, which which uh, has a lot of subprograms and divisions within it for all these various kind of disorders. Mm -hmm. um, as you're suggesting, I, I think that uh, certainly when our emotions are um, giving us difficulty and creating anxiety, in us, that's going to make everything worse. Uh, we know that um, you know this is how the type A personality was diagnosed in cardiac patients is. The uh, cardiologist was having his waiting room furniture reupholstered, and the upholsterer noticed that the front edge of all the seats were worn out, and the rest of the seats were fine. And he pointed that out, and then the cardiologist recognized that all of his patients were actually li literally sitting on the edge of the seats because of all this tension that they carried with them all the time. Oh, wow. And he developed this this notion of the type A personality, which puts one at higher risk for cardiac disease. So the way you wow. keep yourself stressed all the time is going to affect your heart in very specific ways. And over time, mm -hmm. we'll do damage, physical damage. So we, mm -hmm. we all do well to pay some attention to what's going on for ourselves emotionally and relationally. Yeah. yeah. Um, Bill, I wonder if Tova was alluding to schizophrenia when she was talking yes. about Yes, yes. And I'm wondering about that because, again, the, the, um, the like, maybe – it's a it's a form of aura. Yeah. I mean, it's just come to my mind that the episode could be a form of aura. Yeah. Would 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 there be any connection? Like, do they ever do an EEG on on, on schizophrenic patients or anything like that? Not so much that I'm familiar with. Um, no. Yeah. Um, no. That, it's no, got a different no. presentation and a different course. Yeah. Um, yeah. And while well, certainly uh, one form of being overwhelmed by repressed feelings is to become, you can, you can have psychotic symptoms come up yeah. and when a person yeah. is, is, yeah. is being flooded with emotions. Uh, yeah. You can have psychotic symptoms come up. But, you know, I think it's, that's, a, that's an illness of, in its own right, a psychiatric illness. There's a problem in the brain. There's an organic, an organic problem in the brain that's giving rise uh, uh, mm. to these not, uh, uh, symptoms of been, hallucinations, uh, delusion, thought. That was a correlation. That was all. It's not been researched yeah. that that epilepsy or schizophrenia is something in utero or something with the mother or some kind of stress with the mother. It's not been studied. Like, what, you know, what's the research on why people get schizophrenia or epilepsy? Is it? So that's a wonderful question, and I, um, I. I'm not. I have not made a detailed study of that research. Wow. Okay. When, I, when I did we'll bring training, you back on the show, and then you're going to show up a half hour before waiting for Rose and I. That's right. And then I'll have all my research notes in front of me then. <laughs> <laughs> when I did core training, I realized that that all health workers are working in their own sort of funnel, and they're not looking across. And I'm, I'm, you know, as 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 we're looking at anxiety pathways and things like that, and I'm thinking, oh, that patient, they were anxious. It was anxiety that was creating that issue, mm -hmm. and and then we'd have something else happening or a different stage we'd be looking at, and I'd see all of my patients sort of in would fly across my my mind as um as I'm listening to um you know people like Alan and that mm -hmm. and. Uh, and I think, well, when when we stay in our funnel, we we don't look at the cross referencing that we need right. to do. No, I would agree. Yeah, 
We need to put we need to put all together. We're complex mind body yeah. creatures, and we can exactly. we, we we ignore yeah. our body at our peril, and we ignore our mind at our peril, and we know our we ignore our relationships and our nutrition at our all these things. Wow! Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Well, Wait, there's a lot of people I'm watching, but I think that's a lot of people just sort of watching and listening. So this <laughs> will. Uh, Oh, so Heather would like a copy of the paper. So I'll tell her to mail us. Um, here, I'll tell her to mail us. Oh, uh, Barbara, I love you. Look, but it, she's Barbara giving you the chapter, Bill. Pardon oh, me? You already gave it. <laughs> ah, wait, what did Barbara do? Here's Barbara. Oh, look at there. She found it. Handbook on the neuro Neuropsychology of Epilepsy. That's a good, you have yeah. a very helpful audience here. Yeah. <laughs> we have, we put a note. Awesome audience. I should have pulled up my Vita find? in the background so I could be looking at it. Fine. Wait, she found. Oh, where you wrote, <laughs> Barbara? <laughs> you wrote. This is your chapter. Yes. Do you want to write that? Do you want to get this down, um, Bill, for your future uh, questions? Oh, it's on my. It's on my Vita. I just. <laughs> <laughs> I, I could pull it up. So this this uh, this this video we're gonna we, we put it on our YouTube for people to watch. And I think that you know just before the show, I wish I would have done this a week ago. I went and looked up all these epileptic Facebook pages, and I just thought <laughs> I didn't. I wanted to invite people. I wanted you know like you know I want people to be educated. I want people to have knowledge. I want people to go into their medical doctor office and say I'm an educated epileptic patient. You know, this is the future. Well said, Our Carter. grandchildren's yeah. future. Right. And yeah. so, um, uh, I would, I would like you to come back and and talk again. I, I really am thrilled that Rose found you. She's just, she's like, she's like the Mossad. She finds everybody. <laughs> she finds the best, the best people. Um, so we're thrilled that you came on our TMS Roundtable Global, and. Um, thrilled about your work it's just it, your energy and your your enthusiasm is just lucky lucky patients you have lucky, well i'm lucky to have exactly. them i'm <laughs> yeah. lucky to have them they're but they're great. lucky to they're lucky to have you bill and, <laughs> Thank you. and i know Thank you from, much. from our talk in talks in halifax that um you, your understanding and your complexity of your of your understanding i've probably said it the wrong way around but the complexity of how you see a patient is just wonderful to see. It's just oh, really you. wonderful. Thank you. To hear how you. And yeah. thank you for simplifying it on here for us because it just made it so it made it so palpable and so understanding and enjoyable. So thank you so yeah. much for coming in the middle of your day. Sure. Starting her day. Yeah. I'm about to end yeah. my day and thanking God for another day coming tomorrow. So good night to everybody. And you can always um, ask Rose any questions. And if you need Bill's, uh, he's got, you know, Bill's uh, email. You're make, welcome to share that. Facebook, Bill, I, your mm -hmm. Facebook Thank or your personal page, your professional. So I, I don't really do social media. If you want to reach me, the easiest way is just email me something. Okay, great, great. Yeah. We can, I sent everyone our email and we can get a hold of you and, Bless your heart. Thank you for coming, Rose. I love you. Have a great day. Bill, okay. Uh, thanks again. No, 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 can, wait a moment. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I will be, um, it's the morning for me. Yes. And I will be here. So anyone who wants to ask any questions or anything about psychosomatic illnesses or anything in that regard or pseudo seizures, I'm happy to answer any questions or refer you on to the correct area to find out. So it's, um, Eight o'clock in the morning here in Melbourne. So, <laughs> bye bye, everyone, and thank okay. you all. Thank you, Cover. Thank you, Bill. Yes, thank you. Thank you. And great being here. Yeah, thanks so okay. much. Thank you.